Good, good evening, everybody. My name is Tim Stapp, and I am a Kevin B. Harrington Student Ambassador. On behalf of the faculty, staff, and students at the New Hampshire Institute of Politics at St. Anthem College, I'd like to welcome you all and thank you for joining us at tonight's event. The Institute's mission is to educate, engage, and empower citizens of all ages to actively participate in the civic and political life of their communities and strengthen democracy. The Institute is nonpartisan and does not endorse political issues or candidates. Before we begin this evening's program, I would like to remind you to turn off any cell phones or other devices that make noise. Tonight's speaker, Michael Zeldin, has served as a legal analyst since 1996, covering stories such as the Whitewater Monica Lewinsky investigation, the Clinton impeachment proceedings, the Gore v. Bush election, the disappearance of Chandra Levy, and several others. Presently, he serves as a CNN legal analyst focused on the investigation of special counsel Robert Mueller. Mr. Zeldin is an attorney and is internationally recognized as an expert on several topics, including money laundering, terrorist financing, and economic sanctions. He previously worked in the Department of Justice's Criminal Division, where he held various senior positions, such as the Deputy Chief for Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs Section, Chief of the Money Laundering and Asset Forfeiture Office, and Special Counsel for Money Laundering Matters to Criminal Division Assistant Attorney General Robert Mueller. Tonight, Mr. Zeldin will bring his insider view of the complex Washington, D.C. legal mechanisms to share a behind-the-scenes account of the political and judicial maneuvers impacting late breaking news events, particularly the Mueller investigation. Following Mr. Zeldin's remarks, we will have a brief question and answer period. Please use one of the microphones to ask your question. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Michael Zeldin. Hi. Give me a second here. I have a lot of notes. This is a complicated investigation. So I have a complicated number of notes. So it, it's wonderful to be here on such a lovely spring afternoon in uh, New Hampshire. It's been freezing down in Cambridge for the last month, so it's nice to come up north for the warm weather. I'm going to speak as best I can about the Mueller investigation from my own personal point of view. I was introduced as a CNN um, legal analyst, and that's true, um, but I don't speak on behalf of CNN tonight. I speak on behalf of myself, but not loudly enough, apparently. So if, if this is better, let me know. I just hear it like an echo. That's why I'm speaking softly. But if I'm not speaking loudly enough, Raise your hand. So Robert Mueller is a person who I worked for in the United States Department of Justice for a number of years. And it's important, I think, in understanding the Mueller investigation to understand something about who Robert Mueller is. And I thought I'd start perhaps tonight by just saying something about him because in the course of investigations, what happens very often is that the subject of the investigation, whether it's Nixon or Clinton or President Trump, tend to attack the prosecutor. That's a common theme. If you look over historically independent counsel investigations, you will find that Nixon, Clinton, Trump have all called the investigations into their activities witch hunts. This president does it a little bit more often, but they all have, um, have done it. And they have accused the prosecutor, again, consistently as being a partisan out to get them. Archibald Cox was that, said Nixon in the uh, Watergate investigation. Ken Starr was that, said Bill Clinton and his surrogates um, about uh, Ken Starr. And Donald Trump has said that um, Bob Mueller and his 13 angry Democrats are out to get him. It's the strategy that is well-worn in, in these cases. But because I worked for Mueller, I, I wanted to give you some insight in, into him and to specifically undermine the notion that he has a partisan objective in this inquiry. Mueller 
grew up in um, New Jersey, in Princeton. His dad worked for uh, DuPont. He's a person of, of privilege. He went to St. Paul's here in uh, New Hampshire, where he was the captain of the um, hockey team and the soccer team and the lacrosse team. He played on the same team with uh, John Kerry, somewhere pictured up here, I saw him. Um, there he is. And um, from St. Paul's, he went to Princeton, where again, he was a, one of these student athlete types. But something happened to him at Princeton that was uh, transformative, which was that a friend of his from, I think, the lacrosse team, who he was close with, upon that fellow's graduation from college, went to Vietnam as a Marine, I think drafted, but it's beside the point, and was shot and killed. And Mueller, upon graduation from Princeton, decided that in honor of his friend, he was going to join the Marines too. And off to Vietnam, uh, Bob went, and in, um, in the Marines, he was deployed in Vietnam, where he was uh, awarded a Bronze Star with Valor and a Purple Heart, having been wounded. When he, when he came out, rather than do what um, many did, which was you know, go to law school and become a white shoe uh, lawyer for profit, he decided that he was gonna make a life of public service, and he has been in public service ever since, holding most of the most important jobs in federal law enforcement, whether it be the United States Attorney for um, San Francisco, Acting United States Attorney for Boston, Assistant United States Attorney for the Criminal Division in Washington, D.C., FBI Director for 12 years during the 9-11 period, or this investigation, which he didn't ask for but was assigned. So when you hear of, of Mueller, and um, you think, well, is it right that this fellow is one who has a partisan objective? I think the answer that I can tell you is it isn't so. In my time with him, we never spoke of politics once. I didn't even know that he was a registered Republican as he didn't know that I was registered with an, a different party. So that's Bob Mueller. I want to um, talk about his investigation, what he, what he is required to do under the statute. He was appointed under 28 U.S. Code Section 600.1. That's what he looked like when he received the appointment. <laughs> That's also what he looks like, looked like when I used to give him my sound legal advice as his special counsel. It was like, I, you know. Uh, Mueller, Mueller was fond of that um, position. Another position that he's quite fond of, if you tell him that you have evidence, credible evidence that someone has committed a crime, that's the Bob Mueller you see quite often. He, he is a person who lives in a world that's quite black and white when it comes to criminal activity. If you have engaged in it and he is responsible for investigating it, he will investigate it until he finds the evidence necessary to prove it, and he will charge you with it, especially if you lie or obstruct his investigation. The thing about Mueller, I said once on television at the very early uh, part of his tenure as independent, independent counsel was that the president is quite lucky in some respects to have Mueller. One is if he has done nothing wrong, Mueller has the intestinal fortitude to say, I have investigated this, and this man has done nothing wrong. That is not often the case with prosecutors. Oftentimes, prosecutors feel some level of pressure to validate their work by indicting their target or, or, or subject. That is not Mueller. The bad part about having Mueller as an investigator is, like many investigators um, from history before us, once he laps onto you and he believes that you have committed a crime, he's gonna find it and he's gonna prove it. He is a very serious person. I came across this on the internet. I thought to myself, I have never seen that <laughs> in, in, in my entire life. Uh, I spent years with Mueller and I have never, never seen that. So I'm convinced that that's a Photoshopped photo of, of Bob. 
that's the Bob that I've come to know and, and love, or, 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 or that one, but not this one. So, so that's Bob Mueller. So Mueller gets appointed by um, Rob Rosenstein, the uh, Deputy Attorney General of the United States, and he gives him a mandate to investigate a couple of things. And you think, well, what is a mandate? And essentially, that there is a mandate. In this case, it was a one-page letter from Rosenstein to Mueller, setting out that which Mueller says that which Rosenstein said Mueller can do. So I wasn't going to make you read that little print, don't worry. Um, so this is, this is his mandate. This is what he has been enlisted to do. And what, in one of these small worlds of, of Washington, the mandate here looks very similar in part, not the counterintelligence part of it, but the arising out of and obstructing of justice composed of this, looks very similar to the mandate that was given to Ken Starr by the court when he is investigating the um, Clintons. And you think, well, that's curious. They're very different investigations, very different periods of time, 17 years apart. How does that come to pass? Well, Rod Rosenstein, the acting attorney general who appointed this, was one of the prosecutors on the Clinton case who worked for Starr. So essentially what he did was always says, I remember, I remember, and he went back into his files and found the star mandate, more or less copied it, and gave it to Mueller and said, y you're on your way. And so that's the, that's the, the, the mandate that um, Mueller has. It's, it's got these four parts. The primary part is the counterintelligence inquiry, which is to say, did outside forces try to do something unto us. If you think of counterintelligence, except for like Rosenbergs and spies and you know, Bridge of Spies sort of stuff, mostly it's outside facing in. Were there outside forces who were trying to interfere with our democracy? We're not talking about collusion, we're just talking about a basic counterintelligence investigation. Did a foreign power try to interfere with our election? That's Mueller's primary mandate. Secondary to his mandate is, and did anyone in the United States coordinate or conspire with them in the course of their efforts to interfere with our um, in democracy? And in addition, was there, in the course of your investigation, any crimes that arose out of your inquiry or that were in endeavoring to obstruct your inquiry. So that's what he was asked to do. First is carry on the inquiry that the FBI started that uh, uh, Jim Comey testified before the Congress that he was doing before he got fired. Um, carry that on and then in the course of it, let us know these three, these three things. Did anyone else try to coordinate? That's the so-called collusion investigation. It's really not a crime in the criminal code to collude, it's a crime to conspire or to coordinate. Same concept, that's why the media uses collude, because it's just an easier word to say, but it means conspire, f form a, an agreement and take acts in furtherance of that agreement. And or did you see any people who did activity in the course of your investigation that has to be investigated of? Again, if you look at Ken Starr, he was initially appointed to look into whether or not there was fraud in a land deal on the White River in Arkansas, the White Water investigation. In the course of that investigation, he came across the plan by the President of the United States to lie in a civil deposition regarding Paula Jones and her accusations that he defrauded her. In the course of that, that the arose out of he investigated Monica Lewinsky, and the, the rest is impeachment uh, history. But that's how this is. This is what the Manafort investigation was. No one asked Mueller directly, go investigate um, Paul Manafort and Rick Gates to see whether they've done criminal activity, but rather in the course of their investigation as to whether or not there was a counterintelligence effort to interfere with our um, democracy, was there evidence of other criminal activity that you sort of came across? Mueller found the Manafort case 
and he decided to keep it. What you see in the investigation, when you hear of like the Southern District of New York is investigating Michael Cohen, or the New York Attorney General's office is investigating the inaugural committee, or the Trump Foundation, or the Southern District, or rather, the, the District of Columbia is investigating things. These are also things which are arising out of, but which Mueller has decided to give to other U.S. attorney's offices to handle instead of handling it himself. He could always go to Rod Rosenstein and say, I'll take it, just as Starr took Lewinsky. Starr could have given Lewinsky to the Eastern District of Virginia where the crime was occurring or the, cent or the District of Columbia, but Starr decided to keep it. What Mueller has done is kept Manafort, but essentially given everything else away to U.S. Attorney's offices saying, this is ordinary criminal activity, even though it may implicate the president tangentially, whether Michael Cohen paid hush money or whether Michael Cohen didn't report on his taxes or whether Michael Cohen uh, defrauded banks. I don't need to do this. You don't need a special counsel to do this. You, U.S. attorneys in New York, can do this just fine. And that's what's going on. So when you see all these satellite investigations going on, it's Mueller looking at it saying, I have jurisdiction to handle this, but there's no need for me. Because a special counsel normally is appointed only when the Justice Department has an actual or an appearance of conflict that would prevent them from handling the case themselves. That's why when it's the President of the United States who is the target of the investigation, and because he is the chief law enforcement officer in charge of the Justice Department, if you will, in charge of the whole executive branch, they bring in the special counsel to say, the Justice Department really can't investigate its boss and have the American people feel confident that it was done objectively. I don't think any of us in this room, irrespective of our, of our politics, would feel that, for example, acting, then acting Attorney General Matt Whitaker would be an objective inquirer of the facts that relate to Donald Trump. Because the appearance is too bad that this guy has a preconceived notion or his job Security depends on whether the president likes him or not. And so that's when you bring in an independent counsel who is not beholden to, can't easily be fired by, um, by the attorney general. So th those are, that's, that's, that's his, his, his mandate. So on the counterintelligence side of this thing, there are two indictments that Mueller has brought. One is this social media campaign. So in the course of Mueller's investigation to determine whether or not any outside parties coming into the U.S. endeavored to interfere with our democratic processes, he found that there was evidence of the Russians through the uh, various uh, social media organizations that this Internet Research Agency located in St. Petersburg, um, Russia was using to sway public opinion in the United States, and that is not legal. There is not a legal basis for these foreign nationals to come into the United States, set up Facebook accounts that purport to be from, for example, uh, Tennessee, the Tennessee Republican Party, which had 100,000 followers, completely made up. It was just a Russian uh, Facebook front organization. And they found this over and over and over. And Mueller charged them with the crime of interfering. The, 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 the technical crime is conspiracy to defraud the United States of its right to a fair election, its right to know that foreign nationals are spending money in the United States and are not registering uh, to do so. And in some cases, the Russians came to the United States and committed visa fraud to get here. So it was a conspiracy to defraud the United States Treasury Department, rather Justice Department, State Department, and Federal Election Commission. That's social media. And Mueller charged that. And he did not charge any Americans with conspiring. So we went back, we go back. Uh, to the mandate, and we ask, was there any uh, links or coordination with these Russians who we've indicted here um, uh, for, for, for doing this? The answer is no. I found no Americans who wittingly 
conspired with them. So President Trump properly said, um, although if I were his lawyer, I would tell him to not speak at all, because um, he never helps himself when he speaks. Um, from a legal standpoint, I don't talk politics. When the president said, there's no collusion, it's absolutely right. There was no coordination that Mueller found with respect to this social media indictment. The next thing that Mueller does is he indicts another group of Russians for hacking into the Democratic National Committee and John Podesta email systems. That's a, cri that's a crime. It is not lawful to interfere with another's computer without permission to do so. He found that the Russian intelligence officers from what's called the GRU, in fact, hacked these um, uh, campaigns and uh, John Podesta, who was the campaign chairman, with the specific intent of interfering with the election by releasing the information that they obtained during the hack. Now, there's a lot that is said about this hacking business and that the thought is that the Russians were there in order to, from the outset, help the Trump campaign. I, I'm not one who, who subscribes to that point of view. I think, rather, that what this started out instead was as payback by Putin against Hillary Clinton for acts that Hillary Clinton took as Secretary of State back in 2011. What happened there was that there were national parliamentary elections in Russia, and there was a lot of allegations that those elections were not fairly conducted. Hillary Clinton, as Secretary of State, is asked about it, and she says, she has serious concerns about the conduct of those elections that, quote, the Russian voters deserve a full investigation of all credible reports of electoral fraud and manipulation. The Russian people deserve to have their voices heard and their votes counted. So that's when she was asked about this. Well, Putin went berserk, thinking, one, this is meddling in our um, internal politics, and two, what it did was it brought out tens of thousands of people into the streets of Russia with signs saying electoral fraud, down with Putin, and all that stuff. So the, the, the theory that I operate under is that when Hillary Clinton decided that she was going to run for president, Vladimir, Vladimir Putin did not forget, oops, did not forget what she, what she did or attempted to do as to his election and determined that she was going to be paid back for it, which is why I think the DNC and her chairman, her campaign chairman was targeted. And that the release of that information, and we'll talk about the, the timing of that release, was calculated to hurt Clinton. What happened over the course of this effort to hurt Clinton was that they found in Trump a very receptive candidate. Rather than say, this is unacceptable that I'm running against this candidate and I want you to you know, judge us on the merits of our, of, of our campaigns, what does the president do? He says, Putin, if you can find her missing emails, please do so. And other things which we'll talk about in a minute. So when Trump opens his mouth, I say he almost always gets in trouble legally, when he opens his mouth and he says to a foreign national government who is alleged at this point in time to have hacked and is releasing this information that I love you and keep it up and I hope you can find the, the, the missing emails, oh, it's romantic, um, <laughs> that that was the payback for Hillary Clinton in 2011. So anyway, that's my theory, and uh, you can um, do with it as, as you will, but I think that's what happened. That's what is at the heart of, of, of this matter. So that's counterintelligence. So the question then under the um, mandate is, did anybody coordinate with them? Remember we said that the, the crime here is counterintelligence, 
and secondarily, did anybody coordinate uh, with them? So the, that which is primary among the areas of inquiry for this question of did anybody coordinate is the Trump Tower meeting of June 9th. This, this is a meeting which uh, was instigated um, by an email uh, from a British-born fellow named Ron Goldstone who sends an email to Donald Trump Jr. saying that he has some interesting information available uh, that, he, that he wants to make available. The exact language of the email that Don Jr. received is, quote, I have something very interesting. The Crown Prosecutor of, of Russia met with an oligarch this morning and in their meeting offered to provide the Trump campaign with some official documents and information that would incriminate Hillary Clinton and her dealings with Russia and would be very useful to your father. This is obviously very high level and sensitive information, but is part of Russia and its government's support of Mr. Trump. So he gets this email, Don Jr. does. Now, no one, no one that I know is accusing Don Jr. of being the brightest bulb on any tree. Um, but fundamentally, it seems to me that when you receive an email and you're a, a, a surrogate in a, in a campaign for your father that says that I have information that the Russian government wants to give to you that will help your father in his efforts, that what you do with that, whether you're inexperienced or you're not inexperienced um, as a campaign operative, is you call the FBI. When someone says that the Russian government has information that they have that they want to give to you to help your father win the election, you call the FBI. Don Jr. replies, if that's what you say, I love it, especially in the summer. So he receives this email out of the blue from Goldstone, who knew of the Trumps through the Miss Universe um, pageant uh, several years earlier, offering to give dirt on Hillary Clinton that'll help in Mr. Trump's effort to win the election. He notifies no one in law enforcement. He does not notify to, to the public knowledge Don McGahn, who we know later becomes White House counsel, but who was the chief lawyer for the Trump campaign, a very good and experienced electric, electoral law lawyer, never tells anybody. The question is, did he tell his father? Uh, his father has denied this from day one, so has Don Jr. But what happens after the June 3rd email is, is interesting. Donald Trump candidate says, four days later on June 7th, that he is going to have, this is at a big rally, um, he says, I'm going to stand by, I'm going to have a big speech next week which will have announcements about criminal activity by Hillary Clinton. The meeting takes place on June the 9th as, as scheduled and uh, Donald Jr. and um, Kushner and Manafort all meet with a batch of lawyers and others who came over from Russia uh, for, for this meeting. The meeting is a bit of a bust. That is, they have a meeting, but it's mostly uh, about Russia's efforts to have the incoming administration, Trump, they hope, relieve sanctions on them. During the Obama administration, they imposed sanctions on Russia when Russia entered the Crimea. And those sanctions have been hurtful of the oligarchs and have of Putin himself. And, and, and Hillary Clinton was instrumental in those um, sanctions and has promised on the campaign trail herself to keep those sanctions in place and perhaps to ratchet them up. The meeting is mostly, it turns out, about sanctions, although it's put in the language of Don Jr. as about adoptions. You've heard this where they say, well, the meeting was nothing, it was about adoptions. Well, why that is telling is that adoptions is a proxy for sanctions because when the Magnitsky Act went into effect, that's the act which imposed sanctions on Russia for its invasion of Crimea, 
Russia, in retaliation, stopped American families from adopting children in Russia. So the payback for the sanctions was no adoptions. So when he says all we talked about was adoptions, Vladimir Putin doesn't care about the adoption of, of babies that was going along. Just fine, thank you. What he does care about is sanctions relief. So they have this meeting. They don't deliver, from what we can tell so far, they don't deliver much in the way of dirt. There's like no dossier of um, photos or memos a la Chris Steele, uh, who we'll talk about in a minute, that had such a dossier on, on, on President Trump. Um, no such thing is, is handed over. So what happens? What happens to the June 7th big announcement that Donald Trump is going to make about um, Hillary Clinton? It's a bust. Nothing. No speech. No speech is ever given, which leads people to conclude that the only reason on June the 7th he said this was because he was told by his son that this meeting was going to take place and that was the basis for the announcement. He has, as I said, denied this over and over. We heard recently from Michael Cohen, a person who absolutely needs to be corroborated in respect of everything. If he says, hello, my name is Michael Cohen, and I swear to tell the truth, corroborate it. You know, there, There's nothing that he can say as from a prosecutor's standpoint, whether you like him or don't like him, you cannot bring a case on the basis of what Michael Cohen says out of his mouth without essentially written corroboration or other reliable witnesses. But Cohen testifies under oath, not that that means anything because he lied under oath and was convicted of it or pleaded guilty to it, that he was in the office with Donald Trump when Donald Trump Jr. came in and said, Dad, the meeting is all set, and Dad said, great, keep me informed. So now we have this setup here of Donald Trump continuously saying there was no such meeting, and Donald Trump Jr. testifying before Congress that there was no such meeting. He was asked flat out, did you ever tell your father of this meeting? And he said, no. So if there's corroborative evidence of Michael Cohen's testimony, that's a lie to Congress. And we'll, t we'll show it in a minute on uh, um, the obstruction of justice, abuse of power part of it. Just for the sake of time, what we'll do is look at this video, if I can someone show me how to, how to do it. What happens after this is that there's a series of denials by Trump and his lawyers uh, on television that when asked about this meeting and the statements that Don Jr. is making about this meeting, the president and his lawyers keep saying, no, 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 the president had nothing to do with those meetings. And could someone show me how to make this video go forward? Just click on the, no. Okay. Okay, well, we may not see. We may not see it. That's a bummer. Um, it's a legal term of art. Um, so, uh, if, if, so there's, we're, we're, oh, wait a second. Is there, what, can I just show you one thing here on this slide? Because it's sort of fun to see this, and there are a couple of these things to see in the course of, in the course of this. So, if we go into, um, so like that's a pause button. Is there a start button? It goes to uh, a red triangle that should start it. Come here. Come up to him. Like if you like, as if you're not presenting. So, so while while they're working on this. What, what happens? It looks like oh, I is see it, yeah. that there's a series of it looks like you public just put statements a picture. by yeah, the Trump lawyers where they keep saying, yeah, I spoke picture. to Donald Trump about this. Looks, that's just a picture. That's not in that video. And he no. specifically told me, essentially, come on, meet the press. 
and tell you he had absolutely nothing to do with this statement. He knows nothing about this meeting. He's an innocent man. And um, does this work? No. No. No, no. It's a picture. It's not a video. It's not a video. It wasn't. I said it. Um, um, that's not that's not on you. Um, yeah, I'm sure it's on me. Anyway, so if we were to play this, you'll see them categorically say, "I just spoke to the president. The president has assured me that he had nothing to do with Donald Trump Jr.'s statements about the meeting, and that it was a bust, and it wasn't about anything important, and that the president knew nothing of this meeting." What, what, as we as we go forward, um, what we we'll, what we find is it was a lie that not only did Donald Trump not not, not the knowledge of the meeting part we haven't been able to prove the truth or the, the Mueller hasn't been able to prove whether that's truthful or not truthful but with respect to drafting the statement that said this was a short meeting about adoptions and had nothing to do with Hillary Clinton and dirt or sanctions, the Washington Post actually revealed, and the uh, administration ultimately we would have seen the video of Sarah Sanders at the very end of this clip, when the Washington Post was able to prove that not only did Donald Trump know about this, but he actually drafted verbatim the statement that Don Jr. issued. Sarah Sanders then asked, you know, essentially, why did you lie about this? And she said, well, well, he, intervened only as any father would for his son. That's, that, that's, her, that's her quote. But the bottom line of this is a meeting takes place on June the 3rd. On June the 7th, um, there is a statement by the president, stand by. There is a meeting on June the 9th. They talk about sanctions relief. They lie about it consistently after the fact until it's proven that it's a lie. And then the answer is, well, Essentially, it was a white lie. It was a little lie. It was a type of lie that any parent would do on behalf of their child. So if you're Robert Mueller, the question that you have to answer is, and we don't have the public answer to this on res in respect of collusion, is why? why? Why all this lying? What is it that is underneath all of this? And is there an effort on their behalf to cover something up? We don't know the answer to that. We don't know whether the Mueller report will give us an answer to that. We don't know whether we'll ever see the Mueller report. Um, but that's issue number one before Mueller with respect to this collusion um, conspiracy issue. The second is WikiLeaks. Now, I'm not sure who all here knows something about WikiLeaks, but it's a complicated legal question. WikiLeaks is an organization founded by this guy, Julius, Julian Assange, who's in uh, an embassy uh, under sanctuary at the moment because there are arrest warrants they believe for him in Sweden and perhaps Australia, and they think that there's a sealed indictment against him in the United States. He's the guy who, through WikiLeaks, has been disseminating the information that people like Chelsea Manning and, and Snowden and other like-minded people have been stealing and distributing through their auspices. And the question is, um, what are they? Mike, Mike Pompeo, when he was CIA director, was asked, what is WikiLeaks? His answer was that they are a non-state hostile intelligence service often abetted by state actors like Russia. So they're a criminal organization, according to our intelligence agencies. Others say, no, they're a First Amendment news protected organization. I defy you, so say some to show me the difference between what WikiLeaks did in distributing the stolen emails um, from uh, Podesta and the DNC from what the Washington Post did when it distributed the Pentagon Papers. Tell me the difference is the rhetorical question because both of them had nothing to do so far from the public evidence available, had nothing to do with the theft itself, but each of them receiving the stolen property then distributed it. And that's all that they can prove that WikiLeaks has done. If they are a non-state hostile foreign intelligence agency often abetted by foreign actors like Russia, maybe you can conspire with them. If they're the Washington Post equivalent for First Amendment purposes, pretty hard to make a, um, uh, an indictment against them. But what we know 
only is that answer is not clear. The Obama administration, in looking at this to determine whether or not they could prosecute people in the theft of the Chelsea Manning um, war documents, the person who's now in jail for contempt and who spent six years in jail uh, for, for the theft, the Obama administration said in internal memoranda that it's too close a call and we're not gonna prosecute anybody whose coordination with WikiLeaks is the sole basis for the effort. What we don't know with respect of Mueller is does he agree with Pompeo that it's a non-state hostile foreign intelligence service often abetted by foreign agents? Remember, we talked about Mueller, Marine, straight up, law enforcement, true blue. You'd think that he would side with the intelligence people way more than the First Amendment um, the, 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 with the First Amendment people, but we just don't know. And so when you turn to Roger Stone, uh, well, you won't have the Roger Stone testimony, we won't have the Roger Stone videos either. When we turn to Roger Stone, what you'll see about Roger Stone is that not that he has been charged with any sort of conspiracy with WikiLeaks, there is no conspiracy charge against WikiLeaks, but rather what he is charged with is lying about his communications with WikiLeaks. And what he, what, he has, um, what he has done for himself is to have gone before Congress and lied about whether he was in communications with WikiLeaks. When the evidence that has been amassed so far shows that Stone was in fact in, in in communications with WikiLeaks throughout this period beginning in 2016, where he's tweeting about and talking about the release of information from Clinton's campaign that WikiLeaks has, that WikiLeaks is in communication again with Don Jr., uh, pushing out anti-Hillary stories through WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks and one of the reasons that people think there may have been some coordination, WikiLeaks issues its first tranche of stolen information on the same day that the Access Hollywood tape is released. So remember, Access Hollywood, Billy Bush, they're on the bus, and, and Trump says some pretty horribly misogynistic things about what he's able to get away with because he's a celebrity and what he likes to do with respect to beautiful women he, who he can't resist. On Saturday Night Live, remember, um, right after that, um, the person who played Hillary Clinton uh, is playing Hillary Clinton and they say to her, so what do you make of this? And she says, I think I'm gonna be president because the obvious thing was that nobody survives that videotape, that audio tape. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your political point of view, um, uh, the, the uh, voice on the tape, which Donald Trump said was not his and then said it was his, um, is, is the president. But, but from a coordination standpoint, the first time that we see a drop of the stolen information, which has been stolen and in possession of WikiLeaks for a while, is the day of this Access Hollywood tape. It is also the day that the intelligence agencies said that the Russians had um, hacked the DNC and Podesta. So there was an intelligence report um, and there was the Access Hollywood report and then there was the release of the hacked emails. They all took place on the exact same day and if you speak to Robbie Mook, the Clinton ch campaign chairman, he'll say like, oh my God, we thought we had now the winning issue in Access Hollywood and the justice and the state and the intelligence agencies saying categorically the Russians had done the hacking and that there was an apparent coordination between the Trump campaign and this, the story just died. It just died. They, they could never get back to the Russians and the hacking and the intelligence agencies and the uh, coordination. It stayed on Access Hollywood and uh, miraculously, the president survived um, Access Hollywood. So the issue you'll see as we move forward in this campaign is whether or not this communication between Stone and WikiLeaks amounted to coordination 
and whether or not Donald Trump, if it is actionable, if it is a non-state hostile uh, intelligence agency that you can conspire with whether Donald Trump had knowledge of it. Don um, Jr. had knowledge of it. Michael Cohen said in testimony that Donald Trump had knowledge of it because he again said, I was in the office when Roger Stone called and said, um, we're in touch with WikiLeaks and this is what's going on. And the president on the campaign trail says, not only on October 10th in Pennsylvania, that I love WikiLeaks, but he talks about WikiLeaks 145 times on the on the campaign trail. So even if they are not an organization that you can conspire with, they are an organization that United States intelligence offices at that time was saying was a hostile non-state intelligence service, and the candidate is talking favorably about them. From the point of view of, of Robert Mueller, that has to be problematic. But he has to answer the question of can you conspire with them. Roger Stone, as I said, he's indicted. He's charged with all this lying. Um, there's, a, there's a wonderful uh, bit in the um, transcript where he says to one of the witnesses that he's accused of tampering with, he says to him, essentially what he wants him to do is, oh, I don't have the slide here. What he wants him to do is do um, a scene that was uh, from The Godfather. If you remember, there was a fellow who was brought before the House Intelligence Committee in Godfather II, and he is um, supposed to give uh, testimony against uh, Michael Corleone about his criminal behavior. The day before, the consigliere, Tom Hayden, goes to him and says, you know, essentially, if you don't talk, we'll protect your family. If you do talk, you're on your own. But he says it in terms of Roman history and, and, and the like. Nobody ever says directly, do this, do that. They just wink and nod and speak in, in, in code. And um, Stone says to the witness that he's accused of tampering with by Mueller, he wants him to act out that scene in The Godfather. He says, do, I can't remember, I can't pronounce the guy's name, Frank, Pangelico or uh, something like that. He says, do it. Um, and they charge him with uh, conspiracy uh, to interfere with the, the, uh, the election. Roger Stone is an interesting character. He's going to appear again and again in the course of this saga. One thing and one thing only you should know about Roger Stone, I think, is fully descriptive of everything you need to know about him. That's his back. <laughs> that is a tattoo on the back of Roger Stone which is that of the face of Richard Nixon, who he adored and worked for and was a dirty trickster for. And um, I, there's nothing more to say really about Roger. Um, I think pretty much that says, that says, it, says it all for me. Um, again, not as a partisan political comment, but just as an observation about the state of uh, his state of mind. So we said in the um, outset, Mueller had this counterintelligence investigation. We had stuff which may arise out of it, Manafort. We had stuff that could be um, coordination, and we talked about the two primary things that could be coordination, WikiLeaks and the Trump Tower meeting, and then it leads us to the final part of Mueller's mandate, which is obstruction of justice slash abuse of power. And what we have heard from Mueller with respect to obstruction of justice and abuse of power is absolutely nothing. He has been dead silent about whether or not he believes the president has engaged in obstruction of justice. And he's not shy about using that charge. He charges people with that crime, like he did with Roger Stone, and he charges people with lying to him, which is a form of obstruction of justice. He charged Pap Papadopoulos, he charged Rick Gates, he charged Paul Manafort. He likes that charge. As to the President of the United States or any of his family members, silence. And so what we don't know is, is that because there is no evidence of this or is it because we're waiting for the shoe to drop and we just don't know? So when you look at it, though, you say what would be the factors that Mueller would be considering in evaluating whether or not there could be an obstruction of justice charge. And these are pretty much the highlights of them. 
asking uh, Director Comey for his loyalty. There are strict policies in the Justice Department and the White House about communications between the White House and the Justice Department, and this violates that. Not necessarily illegal in and of itself, but it could create a, a part of a mosaic that talks to whether or not the President was abusing his office, whether he was obstructing justice. He asks Comey in a, in a one-on-one -on -one meeting, having asked the Attorney General to leave that meeting so he could speak to Comey alone, he says to Comey, I want you to drop the Flynn case. Uh, he says, I hope you can see your way to letting it go. You know, for me, hoping to see your way to let it go is no different than saying drop the case. He has the constitutional authority to order the Justice Department to drop cases. They work for him. He is the chief executive officer of the um, uh, executive branch, and he has that authority. There's a question about whether if he uses that authority with corrupt intent to benefit himself, he has, whether he is constitutionally privileged to do so or not, un unsettled question. But the, the defenders of the president from a legal standpoint, not a political standpoint, will say he has the right to do all of these things because he's in charge. Others say not if he does it with corrupt intent. And we'll have to hear from Mueller what he thinks about this. So these are the things he's telling his chief of staff to dispute things which are, he knows to be true. He's telling the CIA director to intervene with the FBI for the purposes of ending the Mueller investigation. That's exactly what Nixon did. That got him um, impeached and uh, or nearly impeached and had to resign. He was asking the CIA to interfere with the FBI in, in investigation. When Comey refuses his loyalty and says, I'm not going to drop the Flynn investigation, Many say he got fired for it. Trump said he sort of got fired for it because he had, quote unquote, Russia on his mind. Uh, he tells that to, to Lester Holt. And so all of these things on the obstruction of justice question revolve around the fact of whether or not Mueller believes that those things in combination amount to a violation of a criminal statute. That statute, 18 U.S. Code section 1812C3, say um, that it is a crime to do this, or whether he has the privilege of doing it by virtue of his status as President of the United States. So there are a lot of little facts that we don't know whether in combination amount to a statutory obstruction of justice crime that could be charged or not. We do know, Mueller's been silent about it, and we know that the Justice Department has a policy which says a sitting president of the United States cannot be indicted. So even if Mueller were to conclude that all of those things on that, on, on that list um, do amount to criminal conduct for which the president could be indicted, the Office of Legal Counsel, the policymakers in the Justice Department have said, but you can't indict him anyway. Attorney General Barr can overrule that memo. It's just a policy advisory memo. And if you ask Ken Starr, he was in my class two weeks ago, and I asked Ken Starr, is that decision correct? He says absolutely not. That there's no reason why you can't sit, uh, indict a sitting president. And we thought about indicting uh, Clinton. If you ask Leon Jaworski, the prosecutor who took over for the fired Archibald Cox in Watergate, in your legal opinion, could a sitting president be indicted? His answer, absolutely yes. So the two independent counsels who have been closest to impeachment, Starr and Jaworski, have both said that policy is wrong, uh, that a sitting president can be impeached, and that we see evidence of that in the Supreme Court when the Supreme Court allowed a sitting president to be deposed in a civil action, Paula Jones, which was the Clinton lie that got him impeached. If you, can bring a civil, if you can bring a civil action against a sitting president, if that's not so interfering of his activities, then why would an indictment be similarly not so interfering as long as we minded his schedule? You don't want to hold the deposition of the president or bring him to the grand jury on the day he's supposed to negotiate nuclear arms proliferation, pro, proliferation treaties or go meet with Kim Jong-un. You mind the day when he's got his executive time and you do it uh, you, 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 you do it then. But irrespective of whether or not independent um, evidence exists for obstruction of justice, 
a statutory violation. There is another whole area of inquiry, which is abuse of power. This is a political question um, that, that, that Congress um, takes up, as we saw in the impeachment hearings of, uh, of, of um, Clinton. And this is a, uh, these are offenses, if you will, committed by, high off, by officials in high office against, if you will, the sanctity of their office itself. Uh, Hamilton in, 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 in Federalist 65 says these are political acts by public men at the time um, who abuse their public trust. So you have this, these dual paths where on the one hand, Mueller is looking at can this be a crime? And now you have the House Judiciary Committee who just issued 81 requests for information the other day beginning to ask the question of Irrespective of whether this is criminal, can it be an abuse of office? Can all those things that we saw, including, in addition, uh, the possible improper use of pardons, the uh, offensive tweeting, the threatening um, uh, uh, public statements and press, uh, um, pressers by, by the president, can all of those things, even if they can't amount to statutory obstruction of justice because it's within the president's constitutional prerogative to do those things, can it nonetheless be an abuse of his office? And when we look to the future, this is what is under inquiry by the House Judiciary Committee. So when you begin to look at what they're doing and you ask, why are they doing that? We have Mueller and his report that's hopefully forthcoming, and he's gonna answer all these questions. He is not empowered to answer the question of whether or not the president abused his office. He is only empowered to answer the question of did he obstruct the justice? Remember the mandate, the fourth thing, did he obstruct justice? Not did he abuse his office, did, not did he um, abuse power. Ken Starr had that requirement on the independent counsel statute. Mueller does not. So the question is, can a sitting president be indicted? What is Mueller gonna tell us about that? Will Trump ever testify? Um, will Trump pardon people? This is a wonderful video of uh, the President Trump uh, telling uh, America over and over and over how much he looks forward to testifying against, um, testifying before um, uh, Bob Mueller until Rudy Giuliani, his TV lawyer, um, not really his lawyer, but his TV lawyer, um, I say purposefully because Giuliani is not working on the substance of the matter, but this is really part of the pan. Um, PR campaign has said under his dead over his dead body um, will the president of the United States testify and we know now that the president has only uh, agreed to testify in writing uh, those questions and answers were put forth and, and answered and that the uh, real lawyers are, are standing firm against the president ever testifying orally and it's an open question not whether or not Mueller is going to seek um, the Justice Department's approval to subpoena him. We'll see whether Mueller goes that route. The, the smart money is Mueller has decided uh, enough's enough. I've got enough evidence to, to, to come forward from the obstruction of justice standpoint. I don't need his testimony. And we'll let Congress decide whether or not um, there's um, uh, an abuse of office to be had. And these are the people that the House Judiciary Committee have um, subpoenaed, or I think it's actually a request for information, but that's a subpoena really, because if you decide to decline the request, you get a subpoena. So it's a subpoena or a subpoena in waiting. These are all the people that they've, they've asked for information from, and um, we'll see what happens. And the last question, the last thing I want to say, and then I'll open to questions and an answers, is the question is, will Trump um, abuse his powers of pardon? And does that factor into this abuse of office inquiry? The president has unimpaired legal authority to pardon people of federal crimes. So he could, for example, pardon Manafort for his convictions in um, Virginia and his guilty plea in um, the District of Columbia without there being any legal challenge to that, which is why Cyrus Vance, the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, the minute after 
uh, Amy Berman Jackson imposed the 7.5 year sentence on Manafort and his lawyer walks out of the court saying no collusion, no collusion, the mantra of the president, which they say was a signal to the president saying we're, we're cool, aren't we? Manhattan District Attorney's Office filed uh, a 16 count indictment against Cyrus Vance because the president has no authority to pardon anyone convicted of state crime. And so the thought is, we're gonna make Manafort pardon proof. We are not gonna let him get away with this, so say the state, so say the state um, uh, prosecutors. But so this question of pardons is not to be looked at from the standpoint of, is he um, legally within his right to do this, but rather, is he using it in an abusive way that fits into the narrative of abuse of um, office, the political inquiry that Congress has got to make. And there's a fellow whose um, daily emails I suggest all of you subscribe to. This is this fellow, Andy Borowitz, uh, who uh, writes uh, cartoons in, in their pictures, but they're cartoons in, in the New Yorker. It's free, you can, you can get them. The one I liked uh, most recently is this. Trump makes Pence watch him issue parts to see how it's done. <laughs> so, the, 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 you know, obviously the thought being that if Mueller goes, gets him, he wants to make sure that his vice president is absolutely ready with, 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 with pen in hand. So, the, uh, the, this is all I can tell you, is Donald Rumsfeld in the Iraq uh, war, or the Afghanistan invasion, I don't remember which one, has this wonderful quote about unknown unknowns that there are things that you can know and there are things that you know you don't know, but in the end, there are unknown unknowns, the things that we don't know that we don't know. Um, which at the time you thought, is he on drugs? But, but in fact, it's a wonderful quote because it does tell us what is at the heart of the Mueller investigation right now is that there are unknowns, unknowables, what is in Robert Mueller's mind? What will be in his report? How has he answered all of these questions that we've been talking about for the last hour and 10 minutes? And I end with this um, quote of my own, which is, all I know is that I know nothing uh, for certain. So I'm gonna stop now, I'll answer questions if you have questions and um